Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. The adoption of new technology is happening at a very accelerated pace, from the early stages of APIs to new formats and the explosive growth of data, the challenges and opportunities are multiplying. What are the most significant technology changes? What are the likely implications of these changes? How do we harness the explosion of data? What must treasury groups do to ensure they are equipped and staffed properly for this new world? Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast. Today's episode is part of the 2024 Outlook series, Technology, Themes and Trends in B2B Treasury Technology. My guest today is Edward Galvin, who's the head of B2B Commercial Payment Sales at Visa. Welcome to the podcast, Edward. Good to meet you, Craig, and thank you for having me on the podcast today. Edward, the first thing I wanted to get your input on and hear your thoughts on were uh, technology changes and challenges. We know there's been a lot of things that have been happening with APIs. We've heard the phrase embedded banking, embedded payments, uh, ecosystems. What are some of the biggest shifts and changes in tech over the past couple of years? How do we think about some of those terms I threw out? I'd love to hear your your thoughts on that. You hit the nail on the head with those two or three areas you just spoke about. So I think there's, let me probably take each one individually. There's probably three or four core areas as, as I look at it from the lens of a, a payment network and what's been happening over the past probably two or three years and what we see into the future. And so, so number one is we, we talk a lot about the consumerization of commercial payments, particularly in treasury. And there's coming out of the, the pandemic, there's been a major shift towards for, for, for commercial individuals or treasury users or treasury, treasury, treasury people to have the same experience in their commercial space that they have in the consumer space. So there's been a push to build products and services for the ecosystem with that, you know, ease of use, with that lens of what I may have as a consumer. The net result is financial institutions, providers in the in the system in the ecosystem have had to change how they bring services to the market. So that's led to increased usage of APIs. It's led to, to your point, the concept of embedded banking. And it's also led to proliferation of artificial intelligence as well over the past probably year or so. Let me go into each one in detail, Craig, if that's okay, and kind of just double click on, on maybe two or three of those. So, so APIs, and we've seen f- from our network, we've opened up our network to allow various different partners of ours, be them banks or fintechs or merchants, come into the network and, and use, API, use our API suite to generate virtual accounts as an example. So traditionally, in the B2B space, organizations use plastic cards for payments of goods and services when people are traveling, number one, or when they're buying an organization. You know, they now use an API infrastructure to generate a virtual account from, um, from the network and pay for goods and services in that manner. There's been a massive explosion in the number of use cases that we're now supporting to allow payments for goods and services in the B2B space on virtual account numbers leveraging our API suite. So big, big, big shift. So that's number one. Number two, you talked embedded, I think you mentioned embedded banking, embedded finance. Um, and I think we, at the network level, Craig, we believe we've been doing this for a number of years, right? And, um, you know, we've seen, but we've seen more use cases of it. And and embedded payments, if you will, as, as, as I would call it, is in, in our view is basically meeting the customer where they are. Right. And, and instead of providing a, a payment credential or a payment vehicle to a corporation to pay for goods and services, we are dropping the account number, if you will, into technology or systems that the actual corporate may be using and embedding the payment, if you will, into existing business flows in an organization, which minimizes the impact on the, the corporate customer and helps um, just helps helps them better, more efficiently manage payments and, and their treasury organization, treasury systems in, in their business today. So I guess wrapping that up, massive shift in, in a trend towards consumerization of B2B payments as we've, as we've um, exited the pandemic over the past couple of years. We've seen the proliferization of a whole series of new use cases with the leverage of API technology in particular for virtual accounts, then embedding 
payment credentials into business flows, if you will, in organizations um, has, has also has also been a major shift in, in what we've seen. You had indicated that it's you know, this idea of APIs, it's meeting the customer where they are. And so this embedding reduces the friction, right? Takes the the impact out of the process. It makes it makes the payment almost invisible or less visible, less a point of friction. It's I'm doing some activity. It becomes part of the process as, as opposed to a completely separate activity. That seems to be occurring, I think, like you said, on the consumer side. And that's expected on the business side now. It's becoming increasingly the expectation. Very much so. Very much so. And I'll underscore your language on just reducing the friction in payments. Another use case or an example of that is a a business traveler or a traveler in an organization who may want to make a, who makes one or two trips a year. Now, traditionally, they may have been issued with a, a corporate card, plastic for, for those two, for the, for the trip, right? But in, in this new world, you know, it's possible to generate a virtual account, leveraging an API for that traveler, provision it to their handheld or their mobile device for that trip. And it's a one and done. And once the trip is done, they have reconciled, they can reconcile their transactions and, and, and they're done. As opposed to that cardholder, if you will, having a plastic that they may use twice a year. Just another example of how that kind of comes together in today's environment, Greg. That's a good use case. Now, Edward, as you look at this idea of Visa certainly wants to be able to leverage APIs to allow for this insertion or embedding into the various payment processes. And so there's a there's probably a huge curve of companies that are leading in that companies that are very far behind uh, this idea of tech debt. You know, people have old tech some, sometimes that, that wouldn't necessarily support APIs, and not everything can be shifted over instantly to the the new way of doing business. It, it's going to happen over quickly, but over you know, quickly isn't measured in a few months. A- any thoughts on the the tech debt and you know, as companies need to convert, how do you, how do you encourage them to move more quickly to this new embedded way of doing business? Yeah, I will say, you know, so, so we work primarily with financial institutions, merchants, fintechs, uh, and we've been starting to work with some large corporates as well in, in my business and the B2B side. Organizations want to, want to move from, from many to, many to less, many to few. Right. So we've seen today many corporations, we were many entities we work with, they have multiple technology platforms and they're trying to reduce the, the tech stacks or the tech platforms, the number of tech platforms they have to less. Through that process, there's an opportunity for them to work with, let's say, newer technologies. They need to get there. It's a shift, right? And they need to move beyond multiple platforms, servicing multiple customers to fewer platforms, serving more customers. So one more easy way to support that is, you know, instead of coming to a, a an entity, be it a fintech or a financial institution, but another platform to support that, we come with the APIs. So they leverage their existing technology to, to punch into us with, with API infrastructure. And yeah, like some are not ready, but like, you know, I think they, they recognize that they need to get that on their roadmap and, um, and kind of move into, into the current way of operating of the current paradigm because their customers want it. They will find that. You know, they can provision services to their customers if they do not have, you know, let's say a relevant tech stack and and how they're going to market as well. Yeah, thanks. Shifting from APIs and some of the tech changes to another area of technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've um, we're we're multiple months where multiple months on from where chat GPT all of a sudden started getting talked about a lot. There's BARD, you know, Microsoft has Copilot, you can embed it on your desktop. These systems are being used for real work right now. Uh, the pilot, certainly, but also for real work in some instances. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on where do you see this being used now and what's coming soon in the area of payments? Will this cause disruption, just good things? How is it being used? How do we need to think about this from a staffing structure payment standpoint, so the use of AI and, and machine learning. 
Yeah, it's very relevant. And I'm, I am a user of Copilot myself. So I've been training myself, if you will, to learn how to use it every day. So, and it's, it's, it's making a, a, a major impact on how efficient I am as, as a, as an individual in the organization. So I, let me start with, there's a few areas. And, and I think first and foremost is fraud, right? You know, when people think about payments, uh, there's always a concern about fraud and like fraud detection is a, a massive area where, or is an area where AI in particular can provide a ma- massive amount of incremental support. I mean, Gen AI can be trained on normal transactions and data patterns and generate alerts when it observes anomalies or deviations. So I think as a, as a first use case, I would say primarily fraud detection, right? It's somewhere where, where AI can certainly be leveraged in, in, in our ecosystem and space. Risk modeling, credit scoring, is another area. In risk modeling, GNI can generate some data sets for robust model training um, without really exposing sensitive customer information. You know, we've been looking at how we how we can support, leverage GNI AI with risk modeling and or credit scoring. The final area, in my view, where GNI AI can just provide incremental value, if you will, is in just in a in, in analytics and working with the customer, right? So a lot of what we do in, in the B2B space in particular is help an organization understand how they can be more efficient with their payments, right? And how they're managing their payments, payment B, payments across their B2B suite of ser- treasury services. You know, with, with machine learning and Gen AI, there's an ability to look at large data sets and make some intelligent recommendations on that data set on how a, you know, how an organization may be processing their accounts payable file you know, with learning how they can process more efficiently uh, as, as they go into the future. And then that may, to the points earlier on, may tie back into, you know, leveraging API for virtual accounts or maybe embedding certain payments into or payment credentials and certain payment flows. So I guess to your question, Craig, there are probably three areas where I see um, just immediate applicability of Gen AI in particular, as we think about, you know, the, the payments ecosystem and the B2B payments ecosystem, fraud detection, risk modeling, and then, you know, just say customer analytics for, for efficient efficient payment models or efficient payment modes, I think is just ripe for adding value with Gen AI. And a lot of those are in, in play now. Are there, are there any other areas that you think may come online, you know, in a year or two using AI and machine learning besides expanding and filling out these areas? Maybe think about software development, product development, Certainly, maybe some area that where GNA might lean into. Again, it's early days, uh, but I think there may be two two incremental areas that GNA will support software developers and product developers when they're looking at new product codes and new product setups, if you will, as as they're developing those um, products and solutions. Just the perspective. Yeah, I mean, who knows? It may have changed rapidly, Craig, in the past nine months, year. I wish I had a crystal ball for the next twelve. It would be great. <laughs> well, yeah, it was interesting when it first came out. I was like, we're using it for fraud detection because of the the strength of detecting deviations or any anomalies. And then it was like, well, it helps with detecting patterns. So forecasting and then, you know, the ability to do more analytics. And so it seems like more opportunities are, are being discovered as we go, as, as we move forward and gain, uh, gain understanding. The, the third area that I wanted to ask you about had to do with, you know, data and processes. The background, of course, is that the sheer amount of data that's being generated now doubles every two years. You know, 40 to 45 percent increase in all data of all of humanity, you know, is, is doubling every two years. And this is probably the, the challenge, right, getting your arms around all of this data as it expands analyzing it and it certainly requires you know probably better analytics but how, how do you see the the potential and power of data and the insights or analytics that comes from this and how are companies going to handle this you know maybe you address this broadly but i'd also like to hear how you think about this in the in the payment domain and you know how does that impact other things like finance or working capital yeah. So, so firstly, I think we, we as the ecosystem in general is under under utilizing the power of data today. Right. There, there is so much data out there. I think we have we can certainly do a lot more with what we already have. 
Um, and I always use the language like make, make data work for you, right? And, you know, what we do and try and do with all our customers is, you know, lean into what we're seeing in the data to make intelligent decisions about how to manage the business as we go into the future. And let me give you some practical examples here. You know, we have the benefit at our network of looking across our, let's say, all our B2B issuing business and can deduce what areas or what, what verticals or what um, payment categories, if you will, are on the rise or have opportunity. And then we can bring benchmarks back to each of our individual partners and help them understand where they are relative to benchmarks. That adds a lot of value to some of our partners and customers as they think about where they should be focusing um, relative to what we see across across the network. Right. So that's um, that adds that that helps them make the data work for them. So so that's number one. Second point I want to make is the data then helps our customers build their business, but it also helps them add value to their customers. And it helps them um, and it helps them add value on how they should, what products they should build to support what their individual customer needs are. I mean, yes, it's incredibly powerful. There's a lot of data out there, but I think harnessing it and providing it back in, in an intelligent, meaningful way to our customers is what our focus is. And I think what the ecosystem is basically trying to do in general. I think the other thing here is, to your question, it's how to make payments intelligent. What is the best mode of when a buyer should pay a supplier, you know, based on, you know, the, their, their working capital mix today? What should that payment vehicle be? Should it be on a card? Should it be, should they be doing a wire? Whatever, whatever that may be, as an example. Should it be on a virtual account, right? Um, that, you know, having all that data it helps the business make better, more effective decisioning, intelligent decisions around, you know, around their payment mix to help them work, figure through, you know, their working capital um, mix at any point in time. So intelligent payments, that's, that's excellent. The, the last area that I wanted to dive in as a topic area had to do with this longer look, not just looking out the next year, maybe even the next two years, but over five to 10 years with treasury technology, with payment technology, what should we expect to see, you know, over this longer time domain? So I guess to the future and what we're seeing, I guess, or hearing in market, uh, and let me step back a minute. We, we've just commissioned a, a, what we classify as a working capital index, right? And we, Visa went out, we interviewed seven to 800 treasurers across what we classify as growth corporates globally. And that gave us access to a lot of data and analysis on, you know, what's going on out there right now in the, in working capital in particular, as we think about treasurers, organizations. We're certainly in interesting times. We're in high rates environment, but like working capital is a key priority, a top priority for all these organizations and how they manage it going to the future is key and critical. But we've seen and we've worked with some external parties on this. There, there's going to be a change in, what we see is a change in the in the payment mix, if you will, right? So while there's a lot of payments today on um, on check and ACH, we're seeing clearly there's too much check in the system, right? So as we think about working capital and treasury, we're seeing a movement away from uh, from check. We saw some of that in particular during the pandemic and, and ACH and other modes to more intelligent payments. And, and that may be, you know, some of that is on cards, some of that is on virtual accounts, some of that is on embedded payments within organizations or, or intelligent payment flows within, within companies or new commercial and money movements tools or services that are, that are being built out as well. So as we think about treasury and payments, one of the big shifts that's going on out there right now is just the shift, a shift in that payment continuum, right? And that's driving, um, that's driving new technology, is driving new new modalities within treasury and how people are paying, being paid and um, and want to be paid as, as, as they go into the future here. So that's one of the kind of the main themes and trends, I guess, I, I'm seeing at this point, Craig, when I think of the treasury organization. So, and just maybe just to step back on the, some of the drivers, if you will, as we think about working capital and treasury. Number one, automation, digitization, right? Talked about that at, at the outset. Number two, AI is having an impact, right? AI is going to make, is certainly going to add a whole new decisioning factor around treasurers and how they work. 
embedded finance, you know, the demand for working capital. And then finally, I think the just like global money movement is changing as well, right? We've new players um, and, and we're actually involved here too, but in providing global networks to support moving money from Kansas City to Tokyo, as an example, the you know, so there's new technology um, supporting treasurers' needs around the world and how they want to move money, be paid and pay their suppliers as well. Is this working capital index, is this report available? Is that something you put in the show notes? Most certainly, yeah. Yeah, the working okay. capital is, cool. is, is available and I can give you a link to it and there's calculators. And, but we've, yeah, we've also, we also, again, to my language earlier on, on making data work for you, we have a working capital calculator which we built as part of this to provide data points to back to the corporate on, you know, on how to best calculate the working capital. We also look at it, from different lens from different regions, because what's relevant for a treasurer in one region may not be relevant for a treasurer in another region. You know, so there's different cuts on the on the data and what it means regionally as opposed to just um just a single single global study. Sure, like terms can vary significantly from one country or jurisdiction from another. And I like it. So working capital impact, the whole smart money, how that's changing over time. And Really be interested to see how long it takes for for the the major changes to shift to to move more rapidly to less and less checks and less of the more legacy systems to more and more of the more intelligent uh, payment processes. That that'll be really interesting to see how that unfolds. Yeah, I mean, I would say cards, embedded payments, intelligent automated invoice payments. Yeah, we will st- still see ACH and RTP and traditional cross-border, but there there will be, and there are developments of new global money movement um, services as well that are providing more intelligent payments in, in, in the B2B space. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Craig. It's great to be part of this today, and um, thank you for having me on. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.